we concluded uh, Galatians last week, so I said that we'll start uh, the uh, epistle to the Romans this week. And uh, Romans is probably one of the more difficult books in the uh, Bible to understand. And could be right along there with Revelation, but uh, certainly it's very deep. And it requires a lot of uh, thoughtful consideration and study. But uh, we'll try our best to explain exactly what it uh, is trying to uh, convey to us. But it may be in quite some depth, so it may take longer. Well, it'll take longer just because it's a longer book than Galatians. But we may have to go into more depth in the uh, uh, Romans to get a good understanding of what it's trying to say to us. And even then, I think much more could be added. And, and uh, uh, you know, I think you could probably gain really a lot more in your own personal study and where you really delve into what it all has, has to say. But we'll, we'll do the, the best I can. <clears throat> I wanted to go over just an introduction to it and I had to read this from something somebody else said because, you know, when you get into these things, I had to pick one uh, introduction and I don't remember whose I picked, but I picked one and, and again, it's just, uh, uh, if you read another introduction, it may say something, it'd be very similar, but it can be something a little different. But uh, we'll uh, go through this one and hopefully it'll give you a good introduction. We're not going to get into all the uh, evidences for uh, who actually wrote it, because it does say that. And it says there's nothing said in the Book of Romans. Let me get over to the Book of Romans here. Uh, nothing said there about uh, the church in Rome at all. Just just talks about the church in Rome. There's some things that said about it that we'll get into when we get there, but nothing said about when the uh, uh, church began there in Rome. And really, since there's no indication, we don't really uh, have a means of knowing exactly when the gospel was uh, first preached there, but it would seem to be uh, many years before the date of the, this uh, epistle. Uh, because Paul writes to these Christians as if they had been long established in the truth of the gospel, for he's, he says that their faith is proclaimed throughout the whole world. And that's in verse 8 uh, of uh, chapter 1. And that their obedience is uh, come abroad to all men. And that's in chapter 16, verse 19. And he tells them that uh, for many years he had been longing to come to them. That's in chapter 1, verse 13, and chapter 15, verse 23. So it uh, kind of points to a church that had been there for quite some time. But as I say, we really don't know when that uh, was. It seems quite probable from the mention of uh, visitors from Rome, and uh, you know, both Jews and proselytes, in Acts 2, verse 10, that... Uh, some were there uh, on the day of Pentecost. And they could have taken that uh, message back with them to Rome. It says there in the, the uh, Acts chapter 2 that they were speaking their own tongues, the uh, mighty works of God, and they were devout men. If that's the case, they would uh, have returned to Rome. <coughs> <or> Rome. <coughs> And they would have spoken of what they uh, had seen and heard. And that's how the uh, church spread. And uh, <clears throat> so a church likely was formed there very soon after their return, after, after Pentecost. And this uh, conclusion is uh, confirmed by Tacitus, the Roman historian, in his account of. Nero's persecution of the Christian. He says 
in his history that the name was derived from Christ, who in the reign of Tiberius suffered under Pont Pontius Pilate, the procurator of Judea. By that event, the sect of which he was the founder received a blow, which for a time checked the growth of a dangerous superstition. <clears throat> of course, the Romans consider anything except their gods to be superstition. But he revived soon after, then spread with re uh, recruited vigor, not only in Judea, the soil which gave, gave it birth, but even, even in the city of Rome, the common sink into which everything infamous and abominable flows like a torrent from all quarters of the world. <clears throat> of course, again, the Romans would have considered that to be abominable. But as you know, Rome was the center of the known world, and it had uh, commercial and other relations with uh, Greece and all the shores of the Mediterranean. And there are many Greeks and inhabitants of Asia and Syria uh, who had become obedient to the gospel and the preaching of Paul, or those who had uh, worked with them. Uh, there's concerted movement on their part to go to Rome and preach the gospel to this capital a city of the world. Again, you know, Rome was the political center of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> Title epistle and the epistle in the oldest manuscripts is simply to the Romans. Uh, but the first word in the epistle names Paul as its author. And of course, there is always those that uh, dispute his authorship, but we'll take the uh, scripture of what it says that Paul is the author, <clears throat> and we won't get into all these other arguments. What was the occasion of the writing? Well, the immediate occasion is clearly stated by Paul himself. He had heard of the faith of the Roman Christians everywhere spoken of. Please. So that was in the uh, first chapter, verse 8. And he'd uh, for many years felt a longing to visit there. <clears throat> and he definitely proposed to do so. And, and he got there not in the way he had anticipated. <clears throat> but he was often hindered. Often hindered. At Ephesus, uh, a year before, he had purposed in the spirit, when he had passed to Macedonia and Achaia, to go to, to Jerusalem saying, uh, after I've been there, Macedonia and Achaia, I must also see Rome. <clears throat> That's in Acts 19, chapter verse 21. He had completed that portion of his uh, journey, and that brought him nearest to Rome, which and was now, he was now turning back to Corinth, to Jerusalem. And he was bound in spirit and already foreseeing the danger awaiting him there from the unbelieving Jews. That's in Acts 15, chapter verse 31. <clears throat> he still longs and hopes to see Rome, but already he's looking beyond them to Spain. Rome is to be, as he hopes, a resting place on his way to Spain. Of course, the cause of this change of his plan is not stated, but uh, it could be caused in the great conflict of the preceding years against the Jews and Judaizing Christians. And the records of that are, are, are in his epistles to the Corinthians and Galatians. He had to deal with them quite a bit. <clears throat> Before that, he had preached the gospel everywhere to the Jews first, but in that general uh, general rejection of it was not, uh, it was not an established fact of which he mourned, but in uh, in which he saw an intimation of God's will that he should now devote himself more extensively to his own sphere of apostolic authority or labor and go off to the Gentiles. So he did go to the uh, Jews, but they rejected him. And he said, well, I'm going to the Gentiles then. <clears throat> they didn't like that too much. But his visit to Jerusalem with the offering of the Gentile Christians uh, would 
consume considerable time. There were other obstacles that might arise which would further delay his rival. So he uh, writes his epistle, both to give and writing what he would have announced to them orally and to pave the way for those personal labors he hoped to put forth among them in the future. At the time of the, the epistle was written, Paul was on the eve of journeying to Jerusalem with the offering made by the churches of Mac Macedonia and Achaia for the poor saints. His intention was to journey thence by way of Rome to Spain, which points to his last three months in Achaia. His purpose was to cross over directly from Achaia in order to reach Jerusalem, but he was led knowing the Jewish plots, to go through Macedonia. This change in the plans of his journeys had not been made when he wrote this uh, epistle. Otherwise, he would uh, not have failed to mention it. <clears throat> Although Luke mentions the uh, no particular city as the scene of Paul's three months residence at the time, Still, it is most likely they spent uh, the greater part of that time in, in Corinth. For Corinth was a principal church in that region, and in his eyes, extremely important and precious on account of his earlier labors there. But our intention is also directed to Corinth by what it is said in the uh, Corinthians letters from which it is certain that he had chosen that city as a place of his sojourn when he wished to complete his, the business of the collection and from which we would carry that collection to Jerusalem. This uh, conclusion that he was there <clears throat> is from the following facts. The bearer of the letter was Phoebe. She's an active member of the church at Sincrea, that's the sin, sin, seaport town of Corinth. And at the time of writing, Paul was a guest of Gaius, by whom he had baptized at Corinth. And he sends greetings also from Erastus, the treasurer of the city. And the way this is mentioned points to the city as of considerable importance. This would point to Corinth. And at Corinth, we learn that Erastus was left behind on Paul's latest journey. That's in 2 Timothy fourth chapter verse 20. In the time of uh, composition, there's a whole lot of uh, uh, theorizing as to how or, or when that was and how this writer arrived at the time. But the conclusion was from all the uh, uh, back and forth was that it was probably in the winter or early spring of 58 that the epistle was written. <clears throat> Which we all know it can't be both. <laughs> you can't have a winter of 58 and a spring of 58 as uh, not in the same year. So it's either very late in 58 or very early in 58. <clears throat> What about the Paul's character? <clears throat> well, it's no doubt that he was a pretty smart individual. He's uh, he was very keen, had a quick uh, conscientiousness, and that he demanded, first of all, what is right. He had a self sacrificing devotion to the right that led him to do what he regarded as right. And it didn't matter what it cost him uh, in labor or in suffering. These were his uh, distinctive qualities before his conversion and after his conversion. Now, these qualities were broadened and strengthened by his faith in Christ till he seems to have been filled with an ambition to suffer like Christ for the salvation of the world. <clears throat> His life was one of labor, self-denial, and suffering. Of his detractors, he said, are they ministers of Christ? And he says, I speak as one beside himself. I'm more 
in labor more abundantly, in prisons more abundantly, in stripes um, above measure, in deaths off. The Jews five times received uh, 40 stripes, saving one. Christ, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Christ, I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of rivers, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils from the Gentiles, in perils uh, in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in labor and travails, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fast often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things, and that's a handful uh, that are without, <clears throat> there is that which presses upon me daily, anxiety for all the churches. <clears throat> so he is a very uh, unique and distinctive individual. He had a great concern for the, the, the church and for the cause of Christ. And he suffered uh, more than, uh, well, anyone could ever imagine that one could suffer and still remain the true, the true to the cause. <clears throat> he was not only more abundantly in, uh, abundant in labors and sufferings and traveling and preaching the gospel, but he wrote more of the New Testament than any other writer. He wrote 14 epistles if we include Hebrews in that. And uh, <clears throat> so, how did man recognize his uh, greatness? Well, he received much opposition. But there's certainly, we have to acknowledge that uh, among uh, New Testament uh, characters, there's probably not one greater than Paul save the Christ. And he did more to uh, for the uh, well-being of the church than any other man uh, before or after, again, saving Christ. So we, we owe him a, a great debt. We are the beneficiary of his uh, many writings. Indeed, the uh, gospel was pretty much fleshed out by his writings and we uh, have to be very grateful for that. So in the little time that we have left, we'll start with uh, Romans, the uh, first chapter, verse one. <clears throat> Let me get a drink here. It says, Paul, a bond servant. Yeah, bond servant, uh, it says servant in the King James Version, and also the ASV. He comes from the Greek word doulos. Uh, that's a literal or figurative, voluntary or involuntary slave. Therefore, it's one in, in subjection to another. That's what he is, a bond servant. He's in subjection to Christ, a bond servant of Christ. Uh, here in the New King James Version, it says called to be an apostle. I think that is uh, incorrect. <clears throat> the, to be is not in the Greek. It says in the Greek, called an apostle, uh, separated uh, to the gospel of God. <clears throat> Paul was uh, subservient to the Christ. He was a called apostle. New King James and the King James Version present uh, the words to be in italics, whereas the uh, American Standard Version puts them in parentheses. The, the words to be were added by the translators to make the meaning clear. I think in this case, it seems to cloud the meaning of the, of the word. In the Greek, call is a Greek adjective in the nominative case. So it's uh, from the Latin, it comes from the Latin uh, to throw near or to add. 
that's the Greek adjective, talking about the Greek adjective, to throw near or to add uh, to the substantive adjectives, modify the meanings of nouns and pronouns by either limiting, you could say my book, a few books, uh, or describing whatever it is, the noun or pronoun, a good book, the red book, and it's also a Greek nominative. The nominative case is the naming case normally used to show that the substantive is a subject of the verb sentence or is related in some way to the subject. So Paul is not telling what he was to be, but rather what he is. And then this is a rebuttal to the charge of the Judaizers that he was not an apostle, well, at least not like the twelve. If anything, they may have considered him no more than uh, an apostle uh, than Barnabas. And it does, you know, Acts 14, 14 does call Barnabas an apostle. And of course, James, the brother of Christ, is also uh, referred to as an apostle of Galatians, first chapter, verse 19. Or Andronicus and Judica, Romans 16, chapter, verse 7. So we, we can get from this in its broadest sense, apostle means a delegate, that is, a one who is sent, John 13, chapter 16, or a messenger, 2 Corinthians 8, chapter verse 23, and Philippians, the second chapter verse 25, 25. But the called apostles, the so-called 12 and Paul, were given the plenary powers not given to anyone else described as an apostle, messenger, or one sent. These thing, uh, these then, which include Paul, are the called apostles, <clears throat> Christ's ambassadors on earth, an office, office which no others held before or since. He was separated by Christ from Ju Judaism, and from other every line of activity and dedicated to the preaching of the gospel of Christ. By trade, he was a tent maker, as was uh, Priscilla and Aquila, Acts 18, chapter verse 3. He worked in this trade on occasion, but so as not to hinder the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9, chapter verse 12, so that he could present the gospel without charge, 1 Corinthians 9, chapter verse 18. <clears throat> His focus, as he said in Philippians third chapter, verse 13, but one thing I do, and woe is, uh, is me if I do not preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. So it's, uh, I think it's uh, inaccurate to say that he was called to be an apostle. He, he's, a called, he's a called apostle. <clears throat> he says in uh, verse uh, 2, which he promised, he is Jesus, which he promised before through his prophets, that's Jesus' prophets, or God's prophets, in the Holy Scriptures. So he would have the Judaizers know that this gospel which he preached was promised by the uh, prophets of old and made no provision for the old law to continue alongside the gospel of Christ. Paul taught that Jew and Gentile would be on equal footing in the gospel, and each would be saved in exactly the same manner. The Old Testament uh, predicted a coming prophet and deliverer, and the New Testament disclosed that he had come. In verse 3, it says, uh, uh, it's continuation in verse 2, he promised to, uh, his prophets and holy scriptures concerning his son, and that's in Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verses uh, six and seven, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and so forth and so on. Jesus uh, said concerning his son, Jesus, uh, our, our Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, that's uh, Christ's human nature. You might add, it says seed of David, not seeds. 
<clears throat> in verse four, and said, uh, and declared, it, it said, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. And the spirit here is as, as uh, opposed to the flesh in verse three above. Uh, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Talking about Christ's uh, divine nature. A contrast is made, uh, made between the human nature of Christ and his divine nature. He could trace his geneal genealogy to David. The proof of his divine nature was his resurrection. The Pharisees ask him for a sign, as recorded in Matthew 12th chapter, verses 38 through 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answering, answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The ASV uh, ends this verse with the words, even Jesus Christ our Lord, even is in parentheses, but it says even Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, <clears throat> well, I looked at uh, several Greek texts and the Greek the words are there from which these uh, uh, words are translated. The Greek the words are there in the Greek. So why did the King, New King James Version and the King James Version admit it? I don't know. Don't know the answer to that. But it's in the Greek. <clears throat> in Romans uh, first chapter verse five. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. We have received grace through Jesus Christ. In John first chapter, uh, verse 17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace is the uh, divine side in man's salvation. God, through the grace of Jesus Christ, has done for man what man cannot do for himself. In Ephesians, the second chapter, verse eight and nine, he reads there, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The salvation that grace offers must be appropriated by man through an obedient faith. Paul was a, recipient of a saving grace as any man, but uh, he also received his apost apostleship by grace. In 1 Corinthians the 15th chapter, verse 10, it says, by the, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And in the uh, Ephesians 3rd chapter, verse 1 through 8, I'll let you read that on your own, but it says there, uh, this grace was uh, given. He says, I'm uh, least of all the saints, but this grace was given, given to me that I should preach among the Gentiles. And also in Galatians, the second chapter, verses seven through nine, I'll let you read that on your own too, but it talks there about the grace that had been given to me, Paul is saying, the grace that had been given to me. And in, in Galatians uh, chapter one, verse one, uh, it said, Paul and Apostle, not for men or through man, but there's Jesus Christ and God the Father raised him from the dead. So the grace given Paul qualified him to be an apostle and fitted him to address in the modest Gentile churches. And he received it from no man. We were past the time for uh, cessation of this session. So we'll stop here and we'll begin next time in Romans first chapter verse six and i'm going to do this from california i talked to keith about it and he said it's perfectly fine for him to use his computer to do it but i'm gonna take my own computer anyway so i'll see you next week from 
the land and the fruit and not. Thank you.